Hey there, y'all. Good evening. Happy Thursday to all of you. This is RCFB Talk 67. We are super, super excited to be welcoming Mike Golick Jr. up here in just a moment. We're going to be talking all about Notre Dame football with a huge matchup against Ohio State this weekend. Going to be one of the top games happening in the country. That's a top five matchup. We're excited to talk to Mike Golick about not just that game, but everything happening in college football as well. Of course, this is J.D. Moore hosting on the main. Bob Ack has the evening off. He is actually out covering a game at Minnesota. And of course, I'm always joined by our co-host, Sirius. And you know what? It looks like Mike has come into the room. Mike, my friend, how are you doing this evening? I'm doing good. I got a full belly and the backyard brawl appears to be in fighting form. It's 10, 10 at halftime. We barely climbed out of single digits and every one of the stands looks drunker than hell. Dude, this has been backyard all we've all been waiting for. There's 70,000 screaming fans out here. We've been watching so many turnovers in this game. Guys are already starting to get chippy. This is what early season oh. college football is all about. Let it be defined by the Bryce Ford Whedon catch off an absolute JT Daniels arm punt that, in his defense, he was hit when predictably Pittsburgh in that situation sends more than they can block, smacks the hell out of JT Daniels, and then he throws it up for anybody to grab, and they just happen to get a play that spurns on three points on that drive. Like, it, we're, I saw a guy punt 15 yards downfield tonight already on a highlight. We're fully back. Oh, yes. Dude, it, it's been so incredible to see early season football come back. We had a crazy week zero frost. You know, it seems like Nebraska's counting down the days until October 1st. But uh, just even just in what week zero that we saw, Vanderbilt coming seemingly out of nowhere to post up the most points they put up in decades against FBS competition out in the islands. Just an absolutely insane first couple of games so far, and it's oh. just going to get better. Uh, Vandy, serious... Vandy deserves a ton of credit, by the way, for essentially negotiating a bowl game into the beginning of their season because – while it was 62 points, that Hawaii program and what Timmy Chang's got about, pretty incredible considering the state Todd Graham left that program in. I don't know if Vanderbilt's going to go bowling at the end of the season, but as someone who is a veteran of the then Sheraton Hawaii Bowl, I can assure you it is the best bowl game I have ever been to. They had a phenomenal week and went out there the Sunday before, and then they got to play a Hawaii team that just resources-wise isn't up to the task right now. So Vandy... Way to go. You guys are my heroes of week zero. Look, Mike, what's the point in having a $10 billion endowment if you don't use it for something like following the entire program, not just the stars, the entire program to Hawaii for a full week before your week zero game, right? Oh, no, listen, 100%. And that is not like, like you said, you got to tap into the endowment for that. That trip was so expensive because we did the same thing when Notre Dame went out there that pretty much after that, it was sort of like the unspoken feeling that we were probably never going to go back to that game because the school lost so much money on it to send our six win team out to the islands to enjoy a week before Christmas break. So yes, Vandy, that's exactly what you should be doing. New facilities and new stadium are all nice trips to Hawaii are what the guys want. Let me assure you that. Tim's just eating PB and J sandwiches for the rest of the year because they blew their entire budget. Hey, you know what? Listen, I had a lot of uncrustables at snack time the night before games when I was in college. Those things can sustain an awful lot when you're a college kid whose body essentially turns anything into fuel. Well, God, speaking, days. <laughs> speaking of food, um, you know, we had Shane Beamer on uh, back in June. Oh, no. And the first question that we asked him was about the mayo bowl. So now that you're on, we have to ask you a similar question. Uh, you know, that segment with you, Anish, you're dip dipping all kinds of really random things in mayonnaise. It seems like you enjoyed it a little bit. I don't know if that's just like the, you know, your inner offensive lineman, like coming back out in full force of like, ooh, calories. But how was that? It was incredible. And I feel like it doesn't get talked about enough. That bit was Anish Shroff's idea. And I applaud him for throwing that out there during the week. That game was an ultimate example of knowing your buddy. Our crew had been together, me, him, and Taylor McGregor, for long enough to know, oh, this is right up our alley. We got the freaky mayo game. We need to give people freaky mayo stuff. Now, I didn't anticipate pissing off the whole country of Australia and Dion Warwick, but those are just byproducts of the game at some point. So, yeah, I absolutely enjoyed it. And I will say this. A lot of people come at me about that. Obviously, I'm going to be stamped with the mayo thing forever. 
at the same time, cream-based product on a cookie that is cream-based in the filling, it's not that far a departure. Now, the Duke's got a little twang to it, so you're definitely going to feel that. But if you get the right portion, really not as bad. I saw that abomination the internet today where it was Oreos filled with guacamole on the inside. That is do not pass go. Go straight to hell. The, the Duke's Oreo and mayo is really not that bad when you compare it to something that heinous. Major props to Nice then for, uh, for being one of the foes that because it really seemed like he was struggling with the Oreos on that first little bit. Um, you know, and maybe it was just kind of gumming everything up, but uh, he, I guess he didn't do any test runs before before the no. show, just going in completely blind, doing it live. No, he definitely went in completely blind, and I give him a lot of credit. Him and Taylor both died, hey, we're not just going to have Mike out here on an island. We want to be in on this. And I thought I was going to have to call the rest of the drive because Anisha's initial reaction looked like vomit was coming. And then we get to the commercial break, and he goes, I'm not going to lie. That was pretty good. Like, if we had to do that again, I'd be in on it again. So he was a changed man after that, which should be a lesson to everybody here. Open your mind to new things. You know, opening your mind to new things. Uh, one of the things that I know you've also recently done is you, you ended up uh, leaving ESPN on your own ventures now. Uh, but I do understand that you're actually calling a couple of games starting with this weekend. Uh, tell us a little bit about some of the new media ventures that you're up to for this season. Yeah, so uh, obviously daily you guys can check out Gojo wherever you get your podcasts through the fine folks over at DraftKings. Been enjoying doing that so far. We've been going since me- the beginning of May on that venture. But uh, this fall, yeah, I'm very excited. So last fall, my dad and Kate Scott, who's now the play-by-play voice for the 76ers, were both a part of Learfield's college football Saturday night broadcast. And so now the dad is going on and working with the NFL this fall. Kate is with the 76ers. Me and Sloan stepped in to be the team for college football Saturday night. So we'll be on the road for the next 13 weekends, plus a bowl game. We have uh, Utah at Florida this weekend. We've got Arizona State at uh, Oklahoma State next weekend and Michigan State at Washington. We've got the first three games pretty well mapped out at this point. But, uh, yeah, very excited about that. I mean, hell, I haven't been to the Swamp since I took a visit there in, like, 07. And just to be back out in the road, man. Like, we're, we're here. We made it. So, super pumped. Everyone, you know, check out uh, Learfield wherever you get that on radio. We'll have the Varsity app up and running that will have broadcasts in it, too. And uh, just fired up, man. Ready to be back out there. And you know who else is ready to be back out there? Marcus Freeman and all the dudes over at Notre Dame. This is a huge game to start off the season. It's another top five matchup to start the season. We've always seen something, whether that's, you know, like a Florida State, uh, Alabama, or some other typically Southeast uh, conference team that normally gets to start off. We get to go back into the Midwest, and we get to see one of these huge games. Marcus Freeman heading into his first full year as the head coach. What should we be excited about for Notre Dame football for this year? Well, and I think, too, they also deserve credit. It's a true home and home. Like, we are getting ready to watch one of those usual SEC Pac-12 games with Oregon and Georgia playing, but we know it's in Atlanta. We know it's not going to be in Athens. It's going to be a Georgia home game, but not in the traditional sense. Like, I'm very happy, even if I don't think Notre Dame right now looks like on paper they're ready to win this game against an Ohio State team that's staring eye-to-eye with Alabama. I'm pumped that it's a true home-and-home and they're going out to the shoe. Now, for Notre Dame, what to be excited about? Like, I really don't want people overreacting to week one. Preseason rankings are designed to make sure that there's a great TV product here. From like 5 to 15 where Notre Dame is, you can really have shuffled the deck on those rankings in almost any way, and I'd have felt justified with it. Notre Dame's going to be a damn good football team this year. I'll tell you what to look out for. The offensive line for Notre Dame is probably going to be one of the two or three most improved units in football. You bring back a bunch of talent on a group that got injured early and often last year, You add Harry Heastan back as the offensive line coach for who anyone is not familiar in the college football landscape. He was the guy that groomed Zach Martin, Ronnie Stanley, Quentin Nelson, Mike McGlinchey, that whole group of first rounders coming through Notre Dame were Harry Heastan products. And so for them to have that tutelage back coupled with a quarterback and Tyler Buckner, who are waiting to see what the arm looks like on a consistent basis, but we know can offer you something in the run game at times when that group last year up front struggled, having a quarterback who could hold that backside with his legs really was the only thing that saved them. So I think it's going to look very different than the Jack Cone led offense did last year 
And I think Tommy Reese as an offensive coordinator is super adept at really morphing to his personnel. When you got an O-line and a great tight end in Michael Mayer while your wide receiver room is thin and your quarterback's green, I'd expect him to make use of that bigger personnel and really try and throw a lot at Ohio State this game on that front and ball control, trying to mimic what they did against Alabama and the CFP a couple of years ago and taking the air out of this thing. And then, honestly, defensively for Notre Dame, I'm excited to see what the Al Golden-Marcus Friedman hybrid is on the defensive side of the ball here. They've got really interesting personnel. They're a little thin on the inside size-wise, but edge rushers. Isaiah Foskey is going to be to get to the country this year. He's a guy you definitely watch going up draft boards. They've got some to replace in the back end with Kyle Hamilton no longer being in town. But it, 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 that, that side of the ball to me is going to be fascinating. But the ceiling of this team will no doubt be defined by what Tyler Buckner is able to do at quarterback. Mike, you know that Ohio State has the ability to uh, run teams off the field if that offense gets going. Is Notre Dame's offense going to be able to keep pace with them, do you think? And what do you think about uh, what Jim Knowles said about a week ago that he's got 75% or so of his defense installed at Ohio State so far? Uh, I believe that. I mean, listen, what Jim Knowles did, I think, is going to have Ohio State's defense when everyone gets comfortable back in that form looking a lot closer to what it looked like when Jeff Halfley was calling the defenses before he left the Boston College, right? Like, when I thought of that Ohio State defense and what we saw at Oklahoma State last year, it's, hey, let's crowd the box and cause chaos around the line of scrimmage. We want to get in the backfield. We want to reset the line of scrimmage. That was what Ohio State really got away from in the last couple of years. I wasn't used to seeing an Ohio State defense play on its heels as much as that unit had been. And Jim Knowles coming over there is automatically going to reset that tempo. What he has done in the last handful of years at Oklahoma State is exemplary. And we know they're going to have better personnel at Ohio State. That just is the reality. So uh, I believe him when he says that, like it's going to take a while to get everything in on that defense. But I, I think, man, certainly for them offensively, this is going to be like the Golden State Warriors. Like if you want to buy a defense time, to get all of what they need in there as far as calls and the understanding of that defense, they're going to give you the opportunity on the other side of the ball. Because I think one of the other hires that I'm really interested to watch that Ohio State made, Jim Knowles gets a ton of the billing, but they brought Justin Fry over to coach the offensive line who was at UCLA for a group up front last year that bullied people a lot more than we had been used to in the Chip Kelly era in you at UCLA. And Seeing that and that potential coaching coming over to, I think, polish the guys in Ohio State's offensive line that are always super talented. But with that group also last year, when it came to games like Michigan that defined the season, they got pushed around on both sides of the ball in a way that we weren't used to seeing for a team as talented as Ohio State. And so I think that higher as well for a group that we know is going to be able to spread it out and you get the ball out of C.J. Stroud's hands quick and get it in the hands of those receivers. You're going to be in good shape. But we know we're talking about them as a potential all-time defense or offense, excuse me. And I think that higher up front is really what unlocks it and allows it to go to the next level. Mike, I'm really curious. Marcus Freeman comes in as the former defensive coordinator, uh, not just at Notre Dame, but at Cincinnati where he had a stout defense. He's now taking over as a head coach. And you have Al Golden as that Bob Hinton defensive coordinator and linebackers coach. What kind of shift should we expect with Marcus Freeman going from calling the plays to now being the head coach and having another guy take over as a defensive coach? Yeah, I, listen, it's it's a, it's going to be the most interesting part of that transition. I mean, hell, I think we saw that a little bit with Scott Frost in week zero with having a little bit more time to think through everything else in the game when you're not focused on being the offensive play caller. And Marcus, there was some of that in the bowl game and how he responded in situations. And I think if he was honest, looking back at the bowl game, he would see some of the spots as you got to third and fourth down calls, what you did in those critical situations. And I felt like they weren't as aggressive as you need to be in modern football, college and NFL. And that to me is going to be the thing to watch for Marcus early on here is how does he respond in those specific situations once we're off a game script that they're comfortable in? Tommy Reese is going to come out and have a first 10 or 15 plays scripted up that's going to do very well. Like, I think Notre Dame early in this game has a chance to get on the board because as that defense, adjusting to live bullets with a new system and new calls that they've got to be on top of, you're going to have an offense on the other side that is going to have that foundation up front in a way it just did not last year. And so, there's going to be that, that fast start, but 
once you settle into back and forth ball, when you're just reacting to what the other team's doing, when Marcus does get into those situations, now that he's got the play calling off, will he be more anticipatory when it comes to those critical moments and giving his coordinators the opportunity to play aggressive in the way you're going to need to. Like this isn't a game to sit back and wish and hope and try and keep it close. You got to leave it all out there. Like if we thought maybe that onside kick from Scott Frost was a little much last week, it's probably going to take something like that this week going out there, unless the line just comes out and overwhelms Ohio state in a way that it you know very well could at the beginning of this. But I think this is going to be a game where you got to take some chances. And for Marcus Freeman is how comfortable will he be going for those moments where he's working through the machinations of all of this really in earnest for the first time and doing it in a place where he played his college football the emotional factor is going to feel like senior day did for players where you're probably going to get that little lump in your throat at the beginning of this. Cause that's a place that means something to him. And, and then you got to compartmentalize it and try and go out here and win a game for your football team. Listen, Mike, I have to ask because you did bring him up and his scripting of plays. Tommy Rees is your offensive coordinator for the Notre Dame fight in Irish this year. You know, that guy was your quarterback when you yeah. were playing and you had to go protect him once upon a time ago. What is it like to know, hey, I remember you from college and now you're in charge of the offense. Like, is that a surreal moment for you? It, it is, but it's also not very surprising. Like, if you knew Tommy back then, so my fifth year was 2012 when we uh, we went 12-0 and in the regular season and got our whole ass kicked by Bama in the postseason. We can take a number and get in line with a bunch of people on that. But um, as we were going through that year, Everett Golson was a redshirt freshman who was the starter for us, and Tommy ended up coming in in relief a lot that year. He had started a bunch in the prior two years, um, and – you always knew with Tommy because Everett was their big plays. Everett could provide for us, had a great arm, could extend plays with his legs. Tommy, you always knew he was always going to be where he was supposed to be. We talk about for quarterbacks, there's a launch spot for every passing play. And Tommy was going to be at that spot. So you knew where you were going to be relative to the quarterback. And then you knew as far as, all right, any of the checks that we had, any of the plays that had multiple options on it, Tommy was going to get us in the right play. He was, he was, and it's so cliche, but, he was a coach on the field. He had that calm demeanor. And so now to watch Tommy not only take that mentality, because I always tell people there was a worry when he first got to Notre Dame that Tommy Reese wasn't going to run the ball enough with the offensive lines that Notre Dame had. Tommy's roommates were Chris Watt and Zach Martin. Zach Martin, the future Hall of Famer. Chris Watt, who's back there now as the assistant offensive line coach after spending last year at Tulane. He roomed with beef. Tommy Reese routinely said when asked if he could come back as any other position, he wanted to be a pulling guard. So I never worried about that. But what you've seen is also the time Tommy spent in the NFL with the Chargers, the time Tommy spent with Pat Fitzgerald at Northwestern. All of that has really influenced a lot of how he goes out and uses personnel groups, how he creatively designs plays that take advantage of where college defenders are going to put their eyes. And it's been so awesome watching him get the acclaim for how he's managed all these situations. Last year, there were games he played with three quarterbacks. There were games he played that were essentially three different offenses that he had to use in those games, all while the offensive line in front was really a revolving door due to injury for the first six games of the season. So it, it's been a lot of fun watching it, but I cannot say that I'm surprised just based on the guy that I knew and played with. Yeah, and especially to see that kind of success uh, that you now get to see with your former teammates because, you know, you've had a successful broadcasting career. You see guys who are also being successful as coaches and guys who, you know, they went pro in something other than football. That has to be an incredibly satisfying moment for you to see that type of success from your teammates. Well, it's cool, and it's all across the board, right? Like Kyle Ruoff was my roommate in college, and now he's teammates with Tom Brady in his 12th year in the NFL. Zach Martin's going to walk off the field and five years later put on a nice gold jacket in Canton, Ohio, when he's inducted into the Hall of Fame. Uh, like I just mentioned, Tommy and Chris Watt, who were both my teammates, are now back on Notre Dame staff. Tyler Stockton is one of the youngest D coordinators in the country, my former Notre Dame teammate on the D-line overall state. So all across the board, no, it, it really is. And like you mentioned, other avenues in life. I got buddies that I watch are successful in finance in you know i mean got it i have guys back in indiana working running rv components companies so it's really cool to see really encouraging and that you know it's part of why you you appreciate a place like notre dame you hear all the time about a degree but like man it's just the peace of mind of knowing my teammates are going to be all right based on not only the caliber of dudes they are but on the opportunity and the network they get to use here 
you know, we talked about how uh, this Ohio State team has the potential on paper to be an all-time great offense. Um, it's going to pose some problems for this Notre Dame team. Notre Dame's technically, you know, is coming into this game as the underdog. What would count as a win for Marcus Freeman coming out of the gate against a team like this Ohio State team in terms of, you know, if he doesn't pull off the win on the field, how close does he need to get? What does he need to show the fans in order to come out of this saying, look, we made good strides. We're setting the stage for this season to have a good year. If we couldn't quite get it. Uh, yeah, I mean, listen, there's going to be no moral victories for them. They expect to win this game. And I, I fully understand it from their side. If I'm gauging it from, if I'm a Notre Dame fan, what do I want to see out of this game to feel good? I want the game to be close for the entire first half. That needs to be, you know, if they keep it to a one score game, keep that within reach and show, all right, we're, we're not that far behind talent wise, since we know with Marcus so much of the selling points been the Cavalry's coming in recruiting. And then really the other thing beyond that I want to see is I want to see Tyler Buckner go out there and show us downfield passing as a part of his game. We talked about last year, his ability to go and affect the game on the ground as a rusher, his ability to do that in the short area in limited opportunities as a passer. I want to see him push the ball down the field consistently. You want to see Lorenzo Styles in a very young, thin receiving core right now make some plays out there and show you, all right, we got some playmakers in the room. We have the ability to do that in addition to an offensive line that we also need to stay healthy. So if you come out fully healthy and your quarterback and receivers can step up and I think overcome the expectations early on in this first game, then you can walk out of here feeling good because again, the caliber of you facing on the other side is going to be better than Notre Dame sees for the rest of the season. And now all of a sudden you can then shift your focus to, all right, going on the road to North Carolina, hosting Clemson back in South Bend, making that trip to Southern Cal at the end of the year that I think are all much more important measuring stick games for Notre Dame as the program currently sits right now in year one for Marcus. So at least with your gut, heading into this game, what is the game that we should realistically expect out of this? Do you feel confident enough to put some kind of prediction out there? Uh, for this game, I think Notre Dame covers. I'll put it that way. Like Notre Dame plus 17 is a big number. And I think they can stay within that just because game script wise, that's what they're going to do. I'm very curious how they're going to address this receiver room. We've heard Marcus Freeman talk all about, hey, I got to you know stop the run and stop the run. And Honestly, I think that's coach speak for we got to be able to stop the run with fewer bodies in the box. We need our defensive line and linebacker group to be able to handle this because we're going to have to devote more resources or else we're going to end up like the Fiesta Bowl with Jackson Smith and Jigba running roughshod everywhere around this thing, around the stadium. And that's before we get junior and the rest of the freaks that they recruit in that room. So I think game script wise, it could keep it in that range. But I, I listen, I expect Ohio State to win just based on where these programs are right now. If Notre Dame wins this game, it will be a big time upset. I know the numbers next to their name are close, but in college football, we also know we go into every year with like three teams that are truly capable of winning a national championship. And if Notre Dame's quarterback exceeds our wildest dreams and goes out there and is the kind of player that people expected when he was a recruit coming out of California, then all of a sudden Notre Dame can vault their way into the conversation. But Right now, we know Ohio State on offense is that team. We know they're staring eye-to-eye -eye with Alabama as two of the best teams in college football, maybe with Georgia in that same range. And so it, Notre Dame's got to prove and got to continue to show in these big game settings that they belong considered in that group that right now has been a tough upper crust for anyone to crack in college football, let alone just Notre Dame. So with that being said, so we've got the expectation for this first one. Uh, I guess the last question that I've got about Notre Dame before we do some quick hits on the games that you're covering for this weekend. For Notre Dame, what is a win-loss expectation that we should look for for 2022? Is this team a New Year's Six Bowl type team? Uh, yes, they absolutely have the ability to be in that range. Like Again, I look at the rest of the season, and if you're decided underdogs against Ohio State, you should be able to beat this year's Clemson at home based on the questions we have on that offense. You should be able to in year one, as Lincoln Riley has taken so much from the portal and building this team at time, you need to be able to go out to Southern California and handle your business at the end of the season. So I think with those games as the marker and right now for Notre Dame, I, I think the other important part is continuing to show that you're going to beat the teams you're supposed to on your, on your schedule. 
it's the biggest change from my first couple of years with Brian Kelly to what they've been in the last five is you don't worry about Notre Dame going out there and rolling the ball out and sleeping on an opponent, sleepwalking through a game they're not supposed to lose. They go out there and they have decidedly beaten 90% of college football. It's the upper crust that they're working on now. And so you want to make sure that you're not seeding ground on that. All the way built up with the guys in that locker room because you hear it all the time, right? These teams got to learn how to win. And people always go, what the hell is that? Well, it's learning the work habits that are necessary to go out there and accomplish at a certain level. Like in 2012, when we first did that undefeated season, I was amazed going through that season. Everyone always, like, looking back on it's fun. Going through it was hell because it's hard work to win at that level. You hear guys from Bama talk about that all the time. You think you want to win at that level. And then you actually see the level of day-to-day you know, work that goes into that and what you got pour into it. Now, now that's second nature for the guys in this locker room. You've had five straight double-digit win seasons in South Bend. The freshmen walking in are told by the upperclassmen, hey, this is how we get down in the offseason. This is what we do in the spring. This is how fall camp goes for us. And this is how we conduct ourselves in a game week, no matter who the coach is. I remember talking to a couple of guys around there when Brian Kelly had left the program and they still had the Fiesta Bowl to get ready for. This is before Marcus had been named coach. And the sentiment was, We just want to find out who it is so we can get ready and go play and try and win this damn game. It's a confident group that's led in the locker room. And with that as the standard, I think really, I mean, you're looking at an eight, nine win floor in my mind for what this team's DNA should be at this point in their development. You said the magic words, Mike, you said Brian Kelly. So uh, natural follow-up speaking of winning the games you're supposed to win, taking care of business. Uh, what can we expect from LSU this year? They're coming off of a season that they hadn't been used to, um, looking to make up a lot of ground in a very, very competitive SEC West with a Bama team that they're going to have to face that looks like it's got the potential to go wire to wire, and an A&M that's on the rise, and you know, Arkansas, Ole Miss, several other um, competitors that look to be dangerous. Yeah, so – I'm very interested to see what Brian and their offensive coordinator, Mike Denbrock, are going to do with the personnel there. Because every LSU writer I've talked to has asked about, well, Brian Kelly's known for the offensive line and tight ends. And LSU isn't really at that place rosterized with tight ends where we think they're going to be in much two tight end, three tight end stuff. And so how are they going to adjust to that and make use of, you know, having Keyshawn Butte, who I, I know for Todd McShay, he had him as his number one wide receiver in this class, like, same class that includes Jackson Smith and Digba and Jigba and Jordan Addison and all these great players. And so I think seeing how he uses personnel that are talented in places where, you know, he's not used to having that depth of talent and Notre Dame, Brian Kelly had first round wide receivers. You had miles Boykin, chase Claypool and some of those guys, but at LSU, it grows on trees down there. And so I I think watching how they morph personnel on offense, knowing that just the way Brian Kelly runs a program, he understands where his feet are as well as any coach in college. All right, these resources I've got at this stop, and this is how I can best recruit to that identity and then go out and make sure we're going to perform and play clean football out on the field. So, you know, a lot of that is going to be what we get out of, you know, whether it's Jaden Daniels full-time, a mix of him and Garrett and Nussmeyer. Like, the one thing you do know with Brian Kelly is – he's going to use two quarterbacks there. You can count on maybe a couple of fingers. How many seasons at Notre Dame, Brian Kelly only had one quarterback going out there and playing the entirety of the season. He believes firm. he's got quarterbacks with different skill sets. He can use them in the appropriate way to get the best out of both of them involved. So you're going to see plenty of that if you're LSU. And I think this is going to be a year where, you know, they can't come out and lose five or six games. I mean, you're, I think with the expectation down there, just in general, you got to be nor you got to be at eight wins or north of that. But uh, I'm curious to just see how Brian Kelly once again morphs an offensive identity that was different at Central Michigan, that was different at Cincinnati, and that certainly got different even from the time he came and then left at Notre Dame. This is, of course, RCFB Talk 67. We're talking Notre Dame football with Mike Golick Jr. We've done a solid 30 minutes on the Fighting Irish so far. And, uh, Mike, I know that we originally said that we were going to plan on about 30 minutes. I am loving this conversation, though, so I just want to check in on time uh, because I'd also love to talk about some of the games that you're calling this weekend. No, definitely. I got plenty of time. I'm just watching West Virginia and Pitt block each other's punts and get stuck on the goal line. It's a beautiful thing. It is incredible. 
incredible backyard brawl football. Uh, I've got it on my TV as well, watching in the background. Just absolutely delightful football being played right now in Pittsburgh. Uh, but Mike, you are calling a game for Learfield uh, on radio over this weekend. You are going to be down covering a game in the swamp, Utah and Florida. Coming up, is Cam Rising going to be the real deal once again for the Utah Utes this year? I think so, man. Like, you, you turn on the tape, and he's such a fascinating quarterback because he reeks of the confidence. I saw recently in the bio that his nickname is Thick Boy, which if I wasn't already in love with the kid watching the game and what a true dual threat he is at quarterback, I, I always you know, balk at the phrase because sneaky athlete usually just means white quarterback who can kind of run, but he's legitimately a sneaky athlete. He definitely gets away from defenders who aren't fully ready for it, and he's tough. He might not always be as accurate a passer as you want, but he's got a real good sense for timely throws and clutch throws when they need it. And so, yeah, I think he's the real deal. You've got a line that, while it's losing some starters, brings back, I think, four guys who started at least three games over the course of last season, guys that have moved around positions but understand what it's about there. They've got the usual great running back that we're used to with Utah. It just – it all reeks of the formula, but – I think he is the straw that serves the drink. I think you saw what a different team they were when he was under center manning the helm for that offense last year. And for them, you know, they are as in control of the games they win as anyone in the country, right? They are a time of possession monster. They get out and they score like it's going out of style as far as first half point differential and get out on top of people. They've got two really solid tight ends and Brant Keithy and Dalton Kincaid. And so they can give you a bunch of personnel nightmares keep everyone on the field and move the pace and you can line them up on the line. You can split those guys out at wide receiver because they're both capable 500 plus yard receivers in the last year. It, it's just a fascinating offense. And with a player like that, the more and more time you can spend under center there, the more and more it allows Andy Ludwig, your offensive coordinator to go out there and continue to create matchup nightmares for a lot of teams. And I, I think that's what they're going to try and do in the swamp. They're going to go out and try and absolutely punch Florida in the face as they try and get the Billy Napier era lifted off the ground. Mike, speaking of that Billy Napier era, it feels like nobody has a good read on what we're supposed to expect out of Florida in this first year with Billy Napier. What is your first initial look in doing the research, talking to SIDs, trying to get everything put together? What are you kind of reading on Florida right now heading into this week? <laughs> That this was a this was a team in last year for Florida that was a really quality rushing team. Like you look, them and Utah aren't far off as far as rushing numbers and preventing sacks for their quarterbacks. And so it's going to be same but different, right? Again, you got some offensive linemen coming back there. You bring over who I think is going to be fascinating to watch, a guy by the name of Osiris Torrance, who was getting all American buzz at Louisiana as an offensive guard for them, a really great player in the middle transferred over with Billy Napier to come and be a part of this Florida team, it's going to be same but different because now we're going to get a lot of that stretch zone that was so prevalent for that Louisiana offense with Levi Lewis at the helm. And then you insert Anthony Richardson in there and what he lacks in a lot of a resume as a downfield passer. We know we're all just enamored with the skill set and waiting for it. you got a really deep running back room to Quan Wright, you know, Montreal, uh, Montreal Johnson comes over from Louisiana, so knows this Napier scheme well. Trevor Etienne, we were hearing about him through training camp. So it's just the same setup that Billy Napier had and loved at Louisiana, which is I want a deep stable of running backs I can run through there because we want to be a 12 personnel team that's going to wear you down over the course of a long game, create a lot of those great stretch zone play action shots that we see all over the NFL right now and give my quarterback easy opportunities as a young player to get into a rhythm, but also make those big plays downfield. So the defense on the other side is going to be fascinating. I mean, it's just after last year, the bar is set in a place where anything is going to feel like an improvement there. But I think the country and myself included are really just enamored with what a quarterback who's already getting NFL buzz just based on what he presents to you physically can do inside an offense that, allowed a guy like Levi Lewis to go out there and maximize his skill set as a college player in a way that was really impressive. I think it's kind of interesting to uh, see what, you know, the betting industry is thinking on this game because, you know, your buddies over at DraftKings have it right now at Utah minus three. And Utah's coming off of a Rose Bowl appearance 
And Florida just fired their coach and hired Billy Napier from a G5 school to come in and install his program over the offseason. Know that Florida's got the home field advantage. Utah's been doing some things to try to counteract that, prep their players, you know, practice, you know, create a high humidity environment and practice and noisy one. But what do you think? Is this going to be as close as the, the bookmakers are saying it is? Or are we going to see, you know, Utah just kind of come in and roll and take care of business? Yeah, I, I think it's going to be close, but that's by design, right? Like we, I, I think, got a different sense of Utah in our heads when they just punched in the mouth an Oregon team that simply was not in a place to go out and play that style of football. They were just not going to match physically what Utah did. And then after that first game, once they saw them for the second time, I think a bit of that mental block took hold. For Utah, I think here what we've got is some of an admittance by people looking at odds makers saying Utah is now the hunted for the first time in a long time in the Kyle Whittingham era around here. Last year, they got to the Pac-12 championship and won it for the first time since they joined the conference. They are now having their highest preseason AP poll ranking at number seven since they have been around here. And so all of this is new in the approach. And for a team that's got a set identity and knows the way that they want to win with stout defense and O-line, those two tight ends we talked about in a rushing attack, I think you're going to see more often than not fewer blowouts, but that doesn't mean it's going to feel close either because if they're winning games, it's by being physically dominant. It may not show up right away. You know, it may run away at the end, but in the middle of the game, they're going to be like a boxer just wearing you out in the kidneys, hoping to drop you that way. And so I think because of that, I can understand why the thought is it might be close. You've got the atmosphere of week one. You've got a team in Florida that's going to come out with energy. When you've got a new coach in there, I promise you, as someone who went through a coaching change, that first game, you feel like you're shot out of a cannon. That first quarter is an all-time adrenaline rush. And then after that, you've got to settle in and play a football game. But they're going to have to weather early storm from Florida who's going to have their stuff, best stuff ready to go. They're going to have everything they plan for. And then they're going to have to do all the learning of, well, how do we and this staff communicate on a game day in real time? All those things that you learn that are really hard to replicate Kyle Whittingham, Andy Ludwig, and the rest of that, uh, you know, Coach Scally on defense for Utah have all been doing that for a while with guys that understand what they want out of that program. I think that one of the things we look at Utah, the consistency year over year, we know what to expect from these Kyle Whittingham teams. He's been there for a long time. He's installed his system, and he's got it pretty fine tuned at this point. But with Florida, you know, even with a a new head coach coming in, it's kind of like what we were talking about with LSU, the amount of talent on that roster – is just going to be, you know, insane compared to what most programs have access to that if it's semi-competently run, right? Like there's always the potential to come out and take on a top team and, you know, knock them on their butts a little bit, uh, even if on paper, you know, it looks like they may not quite have it uh, at the same level. It, it, It absolutely is. And I would say if Florida was playing this Utah team in late October, early November, probably a bit of a different way we assess this game. But week one, it's tough to see an outfit this disciplined and this sure of who they are in week one. Because for every team walking into every season, you hear it all the time, but in college football, the roster churn is just insane every year. You're gaining 25 new guys and losing, you know, between 15 and 25 guys to graduation of the NFL. And every year it's a learning experience. But again, it's kind of like what I said about Notre Dame. When you walk into a locker room and you can immediately know what the expectation is from the time you get there as an early enrollee in January or as a normal enrollee in May or June, it's so different than everybody having to learn the language Billy Napier speaks from the time they got there in February on as a staff, having to relearn all of those things. The game day day thing's super real, too, like understanding as a player how to go to the sideline and communicate with your coach between series. What are you guys trying to get out of this interaction? How are you going to structure that huddle? All of that to me plays into it as you're trying to learn that for the first time for any team right now. And in the portal era, I think this is doubly important because you're seeing so much turnover in spots that you've got to worry extra all those little stressors in a game like this. And again, in one where the margins are going to be close because of style of play, you've got a team on one side that do- doesn't have to think so they can play vicious and they can play sure of themselves. And a team on the other side that if things go well early, Florida can make this interesting. But if Utah comes out and punches them in the mouth early for a team that's dealing with a new staff and a lot of new around them and that expectation of being at home, it's always a really interesting bit of mental test at the beginning of the season. And I think that's why Utah is, you know, 
even as just a three-point favorite, to a lot of people might feel a bit more secure than that because they walk in here with the timing of it in the season being week one. RCFB Talk 67, talking with Mike Golick Jr., both about Notre Dame football and some of the games that he is covering this weekend. Uh, Mike, uh, you know, your semi, <laughs> semi-conference mates uh, with uh, Pitt – Tying it back up again, it's 17 all in the third. Uh, unsportsmanlike conducts on West Virginia after Pitt ties it up. You know, I just have to uh, absolutely ask because uh, it's something that we saw in this offseason. It continues to change. We kind of saw that first major wave of realignment uh, when you were playing ball there. Uh, we've got USC and UCLA uh, now moving into the Big Ten. Uh, there's a lot of chatter about what Notre Dame's next uh, media deal is going to look like, whether they should be a part of the Big Ten. And I just kind of want to know, as a longtime independent and as somebody who has been in that atmosphere before of we understand why we're an independent, what are the general thoughts around conference realignment if you are a Notre Dame fan right now? I mean, I think at the end of the day, like – most of us, I can't speak for, and, and this is what I always try and point out, there's a lot of different factions in Notre Dame fans, right? There are the old guard that's always going to want things to stay the same. They didn't want the Jumbotron in the stadium. They didn't want turf on the field. They didn't want the ND logo in the middle of the field. You can keep going on down the list. And those things are still there. I think for everyone else, the way we look at it in college football is we've gotten spoiled lately as fans. Having a 10-win floor is a place that feels really great, and I've enjoyed that because – as someone who grew up with Bob Davey and Ty Willingham and all the, the losing seasons in my childhood, it's been good, clean living here for the last handful of years. And so I think for everyone now, what you want is an opportunity to be around and see if you can break through that next level and to continue to have the school in a position to be where it's been, which is having a shot at the playoffs. That's why I don't think there's any pressing for them to go and join a conference right now, because that TV deal is going to be worth something pretty, I'd say, substantial for Notre Dame as an independent based on what we saw ESPN turn down with the B-list Big Ten package. I think Notre Dame is going to continue to have access to the playoff. As we know, there's votes going on right now on expansion that I still don't think is coming until 2026 for TV reasons. But what did you hear from Kevin Warren not too long ago? Yeah, I'm kind of ready to stop in my stance on automatic qualifiers. So if you're going to an 8, 12, whatever team playoff, and you're probably not going to have automatic qualifiers since Greg Sankey and the SEC don't seem too keen on him. Kevin Warren says he's going to soften his stance on him. Like everything I just mentioned is advantage Notre Dame when it comes to continuing to get the things they want out of independence. And so while that's still the case, I think everyone understands if and when it was going to happen, it would be the Big Ten at this point. But I don't think there's anything that says before the next round of major realignment, Notre Dame's got to jump out. How big of an impact on Jim Delaney's legacy is it going to be that in 2020, Notre Dame actually was looking to play a conference schedule. ACC came in and said, yeah, we'll let you do it, but you only have to do it for this season if you give us, you know, a cut of your NBC money. And then that was it, you know, had had a little bit of leverage over Notre Dame, which we typically haven't seen. They've been able to wield independence very effectively in terms of their media deals and their partial partnerships with the ACC. And he had them with and just was not able to capitalize on it in terms of getting a longer agreement to play actual conference football. You know what? I actually, if I'm going to look and talk about it, I think part of that is a little bit unfair to Jim Delaney, just because that was perceived, at, you know, leverage from the outside. I don't know how real it is in actuality, just because I think Notre Dame was going to be able to find those games somewhere, man. Like I, I think when people around college football look at Notre Dame, they just see money. And what have we seen? That's all that matters to the people making these decisions is money. And so as long as they keep looking at the dome and keep seeing dollar bills around it, people are going to kind of make concessions for that. And for the ACC, I think it was certainly hugely beneficial. And we saw that reflected in the ratings for the Notre Dame Clemson games that year. It was super beneficial for them to have the Irish around there. There was going to be a bump that came with that. And so I think expecting him to play that level of hardball in that environment, knowing we were also in the middle of a global pandemic, might be a bit of revisionist history that I'm not going to say is as fair as I'd like to be to Jim Delaney in that spot. Mike, we are now about hitting that 45-minute mark, so I'm going to let you go here in just a moment so that you can get back to football as well. Uh, but we got to know, you know, not just on Learfield, you got a lot of different uh, stokes in the fire, so to say. Where can people find you and your content for this upcoming football season? 
Uh, yeah, so I'll have the daily podcast. It's Gojo Show. It's wherever you get your podcast. So catch us and watch us on the DraftKings YouTube channel there. We've got a Gojo with Mike Golick Jr. playlist on there. We are five days a week. We're in your feed in the morning. We're going to try and be doing a bunch of stuff around games with game watches and other stuff like that over the course of a long season. The Learfield season is going to be great again. Those games, we got the first three weeks that everyone can keep locked in on. The Learfield is a part of the Varsity app where you can listen to that on your phone. I know I did that driving around a lot of back roads last year, listen to my dad and Kate Scott on those games as I was going through on the app. So you can also check out their YouTube page. We'll have a feed of our booth up there so you guys can watch me power chug ice cream or do whatever the hell else I eat in the press box during the course of a game with Sloan Martin in there with me. And uh, yeah, that's going to be the mainstays for this fall, man. I'm, I'm really excited about it. It's a great opportunity. And I know I got to see my dad and Kate up close last year doing that. We were both on the same call for NC State at Mississippi State last year. And it's just, it's the kind of fun college football is supposed to be, right? It's that energy that we had in the Duke's Mayo Bowl that gets taken over to radio and audio each and every week and allows us to, I think, do justice for college football, which as we're seeing in the backyard brawl tonight is an insanely chaotic, mostly drunk sport that never knows what it's going to give us next. And so that's, that's kind of where I'm going to be. That's what I'm looking forward to doing this fall, man. And just uh, excited to get out there and finally do the damn thing. Talking season has been long enough. <laughs> it has been long enough indeed mike thank you so much for hopping on for quite a few minutes with us we really appreciate it you have been an awesome guest uh looking forward to listening to you on different broadcasts again for this upcoming season and of course with the irish this awesome preview that you've given us uh wishing the best for everybody in south bend go irish go win one for the gipper all that uh, kind of good stuff thank you so much for being on with us no thanks for having me guys really appreciate it everybody uh enjoy the week we got five days of college football let's get after it it is a beautiful time to be a college football fan thank you so much mike thanks guys now as a reminder uh that was mike golick jr talking about notre dame football and some of the games that he's broadcasting this upcoming weekend on rcfb talk 67 once again my name is jd moore signing off for reddit Thanks again to my co-host, Sirius, for coming on, and we are amped about college football being back. Now, I'm going to hang up and listen.